Hello, and welcome to the podcast advertising playbook. I'm your host, Heather Osgood. And today I am joined by Jeff Vidler. Now, Jeff is the president and founder of Signal Hill, and I am excited to have him on the show because to be honest, I don't know a ton about Signal Hill and the work they're doing. So Jeff, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you very much, Heather. I'm really honored to be here. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, so now, Jeff, why don't we start out by having you tell us just a little bit about your background and how you made your way into the podcast space? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I love audio. I've loved audio all my life. And, and, and I'm really fortunate enough to have had sort of two careers. My first career was working in radio. I was a copywriter and then music director, program director, station manager, consultant. And that's when I got into research. Um, and that was my second career as research. And a lot of that, I did actually research for television and print and, and digital, but most of the research, my media research years were um, spent on radio. But the last since about 2016, um, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into podcasting. And we started our company two years ago, Signal Hill Insights, really focusing on that, doubling down on podcasting, audio in general, but just helping advertisers, broadcasters, publishers tap into all those new opportunities that are out there in audio. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when you think of new opportunities in audio, you can't help but think of podcasting, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So anytime I think about research and radio in particular, I think back to my days, my early days in my career selling radio advertising and working with Arbitron and thinking that Arbitron was the best thing until many years later when I found out that maybe the, the research wasn't quite as you know substantiated as I wished it had been maybe at the time. But in terms of audio, I think it can be a really tricky medium to study just because because of the nature of what it is, I, I really do think that with podcasting, it's different because it is so intentional. You know, radio listening is still, of course, intentional, but there is this passivity to it. And I remember when we sold ads, we would say that was a great thing, right? Because people wouldn't even realize they were listening to the radio and suddenly they would hear this ad and it would change their world, right? But I think that um, audio can be a little bit challenging to research. Have you found that? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it is in the sense that it's not the most tangible of all media, right? right. And I think, and that, and that's only, I think, in taking what radio does and taking it to the street and selling it probably is the toughest part, is the tangible side. And and if the research isn't great, then that only makes it a bigger challenge. But I do believe, if we compare podcasting to radio, I think podcasting has a lot more as a digital medium has a lot greater opportunity to really be able to be an accurate measurement of listening. We're not there yet. We're just getting started and there's still lots of uh, mountains to climb, but the potential is there. And for radio, it's just it, the over the air radio. How do you really measure that effectively with any kind of sample size or anything else that's really going to give you um, the data that you need? One thing we do have with podcasting is we have digital data that gives us census level data as a baseline that we can use and, and, and work from that and really give advertisers a chance to see how the medium's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you dig into that a little bit? I'm really curious kind of what some of your methodology has been when you do uh, this research. Our specialty really is that we are survey research based audio research consultancy. And that means that there's various applications of that. So probably the thing that really got us into podcasting in the first place was the work we did with Pacific content. I was fortunate enough to have done some research for the CBC in Canada, the public broadcaster, and two really smart guys came out of CBC, Steve Pratt and Chris Boyce, and started this amazing company called Pacific Content, creating really high-end original podcast for brands. And as they just got started, they had brands saying, but I need to be able to prove to my CMO that this is actually worth all of this money we're spending to produce this really high-end audio. So they came to me and, and it gave us a chance to sort of try a few different things and, and build different ways actually of being able to establish what the brand of podcast is doing for those clients. So we still probably do more research in branded podcasts than anybody else anywhere. And because of that, you know, head start that we got, but after that sort of opened the door to see that there are other opportunities uh, for advertisers um, in the medium, and there's a need for information measurement gap is still a big part of the story. This 
what is keeping a podcast from getting its sort of maximum opportunity of monetization. We've been doing a lot of brand list studies as well for, on advertiser side. So working with Stitcher, I don't know, SXM Media, they are Cumulus, working with iHeart and, and doing a lot of work too in Canada still. Canada is a little bit behind the US, well, actually quite a bit behind the US in terms of uh, developing a podcast industry, but it's just starting to the point now that they are having to go to the market to do brand lift studies to be able to prove the value of that medium to get some of those advertising dollars as well. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. right now, probably 60, 70% of the brand lift work we do, actually maybe 70 or 80% if you include the branded podcast is, is in the U.S. So we also so- do, again, an expansion of what I mean by say survey research. We also do a study in Canada called the Canadian Podcast Listener Study, which we've been doing since 2017. So it's now when it's, I guess this will make it its sixth year. And that's really just to sort of provide some information to the marketplace to educate and inform and elevate the medium to help advertisers understand it, help you know people who are creators and, and publishers understand what the opportunities are. And it's been a great opportunity working with Jeff Ulster from Ulster Media, who actually also was was head of digital talk at CBC at one time, but he is now one of the partners in TPX, the podcast exchange there, and they're a partner with us on that. And probably the thing that, you know, again, a similar application, but on the survey side is the work we've been doing over the past year uh, with Triton Digital. Triton, as you may be familiar, has an initiative they call Podcast Metrics. Mm -hmm. where they work with publishers and and they validate the downloads from those publishers and then put it into a ranker for those subscribing publishers. Daryl Battaglia, who heads that up, came to us actually about two years ago when we started conversations about this because of the work we do in survey research, said, well, what if you did surveys and we mix that survey data to be able to attach demographics to the census level data that we have? And, you know, and so we've about a data scientist in who's been working with us on that and being able to take census level data, the survey data, and effectively increase sample size. I mean, we do 12,000 studies, surveys a year. We just finished our first year. But even at that, you've really only got the top 200 podcasts have enough sample size to really give you a clear demographic picture. But by being able to connect that to podcasts that people listen to and the other podcasts they listen to, we're able to develop neighborhoods to bring in survey data from all the other podcasts that people who listen to that podcast would also listen to. And then that's been all able to uh, give us and Triton the opportunity to go down to, I think we're really, you know, getting reliable, robust profiles down to about five thousand, six thousand of the podcasts that they have. So wow. Um, um, so it's it's one of those measurement things. That, that has been a bit elusive for podcasting is getting at demographics. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, for you sure. Do I mean, listener surveys, you can, you know, and you, and that's great, but they're engaged listeners and that's worth something in itself, but it's not what advertisers necessarily are looking for. You've got apps that will give you demographics, but that's filtered through who uses those apps. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily a reflection of their entire audience. There's household graphs that you can get, but IP address, but again, it's really not personal, right? So we think that this is an important step towards getting Mm -hmm. demographics into uh, podcast measurement. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Triton because I think that that's really, really fascinating. And I I know Daryl actually has been on the show and we've we've talked about this. So it's um, great to hear the other side of it. So what they're doing is they're looking at census level data, which is what they are calculating. And then you are looking at the the survey data and you're going out and surveying people. I know um, obviously with Edison Research and the reports that they create that that is survey level as well. But I guess I'm curious you had mentioned surveying, I think you said 12 to 15,000 people. 12,000, yeah. 12,000. Yeah. Okay. How are you getting to, so if you're, let's say you're surveying 12,000 people, and I don't know if that's all for this one Triton project, but if you're surveying them, are you just asking them about the podcast that they listen to? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're brief surveys. They're about seven minute surveys and so that they can stay efficient. But we do collect demographics, the demographics that they can then bring into the data to, that we can then you know, help to model profiles from the using the census level data. And we ask listeners 
based on monthly podcast listeners, they have to say they listen to podcasts in the past month and that they listen on a monthly basis. And we ask them to name up to 10 podcasts that they've listened to in the past year. And there's a, we have an autofill that allows them to go in and they can see the cards as they're typing in, they can see what podcast is and they can click on the card and give us that information. And that's, that's the basis for the survey. That's how we collect that. That's great. That's, that's terrific. And I, I think, I mean, you obviously hit the nail on the head. One of the hardest pieces of all of this, you know, in, I mean, of the industry in general is that demographics piece. And I think that you are spot on because, you know, Spotify provides us with really great metrics. So if you go into Spotify, you get exactly what you need to tell an advertiser like, hey, look, this is this audience. But I think it's really fascinating. Um, we had a, a show that recently joined True Native and we were talking to them about their demographics and we were like, well, what does Spotify say? And he's like, well, Spotify is like 5% of my audience and what they represent is very different than what we have seen in other, you know, even just like the information that Apple provides or the information that we've done on survey. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is how skewed it is, because if I'm a Spotify user, that in and of itself puts me in a particular category, which is then going to skew the information, right? Because right. people who use Spotify fit into their own demographic of users versus maybe somebody who uses Google or somebody who uses Apple or, you know, whatever, you know, player that they're using, those are all skewed a little bit. And it is really not the easiest thing to determine who exactly is listening to a podcast. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, Spotify, a good example of Spotify. If you look at people who say that Spotify is their primary podcast platform, I mean, depending on the survey, you know, having done this over the last several years, as Spotify has, you know, uh, become a really big factor. And it's amazing what they've achieved really in about three years. I mean, not much more than three years, three, three mm -hmm. and a half years. It's true. But it is a younger audience, between five and eight years younger on average than an Apple podcast listener. Someone who, you know, chooses Apple as their primary podcast platform. YouTube is another story entirely, but that's, it's very young or very old, actually, is, is the weird thing there, right? It's oh, YouTube comes, is very young and very old? Very old, very young and very old. That's where you see it indexing high, yeah. 1824s or younger, and you also see it 55 plus as well. That's so fascinating. So my dad came to visit for a week recently, and I swear the man just watched YouTube. <laughs> And I was like, what are you doing? I was kind of shocked, but, um, but not too much. You know, he's got his own interests and he was like finding all of these weird YouTube videos to like listen to them. And so I don't know, that's really, and then I've got my 13 year old who like, I can't unplug from YouTube either. You so, you but go. I never go on YouTube. I just don't have the time. I don't, I don't have the time to go on YouTube. <laughs> so that is really fascinating. I, I mean, it, realize for a lot that. of people, YouTube is the place they go for all their entertainment information. So why not podcast too, right? Right. Oh, absolutely. And I do really think that, you know, YouTube could potentially take over the entire industry if they wanted to, because mm -hmm. realistically, if people were listening to YouTube for free, then we would have a big issue on our hands as an industry, right? Because I think everybody would go to YouTube to listen to their podcast because so many people are already there viewing videos. But that is interesting and maybe something I should personally dig into a little bit more is if we're missing that maybe 20, 25 to 55 year old, that in and of itself could be a challenge if those people aren't on YouTube in the same degree. Right, right. exactly. Very interesting. So, okay, so yeah, so talking about the fact that, you know, even though we are provided with stats from different platforms, ultimately, I think it's about creating a more cohesive view of your entire audience, which is, you know, can be a little bit challenging to get to. You recently wrote an article about kind of just some of the changes and some of the crossroads that we are at as an industry. And I thought some of the points that you made were really interesting. And, you know, one of them that stood out to me was that as an opportunity, you listed better metrics. And I know that, gosh, we have used pod sites for quite some time. Obviously, they have recently been acquired by Spotify and 
just the other day I was in pod sites with one of my sales reps and we were looking at a campaign and we were looking how it performed and she's a, a newer sales rep. And so I was pointing out some, you know, aspects of the campaign to her. And I was like, look at the conversion rate, look at how many people visited this site and look at how many of, of, you know, how many listeners we got. And, you know, we were just kind of processing through all of the numbers. And as we were going through it, it just made me feel so good. And it made her feel so confident in being able to create campaigns that are going to be successful because we had some really good, hard numbers and some great conversion rates. And it's so terrific to see all of that. And yet I think for myself and maybe many people in the industry, there's this underlying insecurity about mm -hmm. what is going to happen with those attribution companies now that they've been acquired. And so I guess I'm just curious when you think about those better metrics, do you feel like there are any companies that are maybe coming up through the ranks to potentially replace that? Or, or what are you seeing with that? I, I think there are a lot of companies right now looking at that opportunity, a lot of companies getting phone calls to say, what can you do? Because we are a little concerned about, you know, using pod sites or trauma. I'm not sure that's entirely fair, but it's understandable. We'll find out, I guess, what happens along the way. But obviously, you know, Spotify is a data company. They're a music streaming company, a podcast company. But if you go back to their for early days, I mean, a lot of it is built on data. And so you do wonder, having that data inside, what are they going to do with that? And how are they going to use that to better themselves? And, you know, and probably not at the, at the expense of an individual advertiser or publisher even, but it does, I think, make people feel a bit uncomfortable. We've been having conversations with some of those other companies to see if there's a chance that we can help them build that better mousetrap that is truly independent. And, and I think there's a real potential there. Mm -hmm. Better metrics, I mean, to, to, is also about recognizing, and again, part of the crossroads, podcasting was built on the backs of direct response advertisers. And why? Because there was no measurement. I mean, one of my theories, anyhow, is that there was no measurement. I mean, how are you going to know my ad is working? Because I have no way of measuring. And you know, they're telling me how many downloads they have. Do they really know how many people are listening? All of that. So... Well, I'll put a vanity URL in there and I'll see if it can drive con people to my website and conversion. And lo and behold, I mean, podcasting has worked like magic for those direct response advertisers. And they keep coming back and they keep coming back and they're still responsible. Still look at those Magellan charts every month and it's still mostly uh, direct response advertisers in the top. Although Magellan also tracks that there's more and more brand advertisers coming into the medium, but they're just testing it. They aren't really didn't seem fully committed to it in that same way. And, and I think part of it is, and certainly something that we hope to help solve, the brand advertiser doesn't necessarily care that much about website visits or sales conversions online. If I'm, and actually an example of one that I saw uh, recently, Milano Cookies. They don't mm. really care that you go online to look at their cookies or you, they want to know that you're going to think of Milano cookies when you're walking down the supermarket aisle and reminding you that how much you love Milano cookies, right? So those attribution services, as great as they are, aren't particularly helpful for those brand advertisers who are coming and testing and learning, trying the medium and trying to see how effective it can be. So mm -hmm. that the only way to do that, I mean, is, and, and again, what we do is survey research. Mm -hmm. And how can you use survey research to help show that same kind of lift that they're seeing with web visits and sales conversions also connects to awareness, favorability, consideration, all of those things that put a brand in people's heads when they're ready to make that buying decision. Not at that moment necessarily, but when they're ready to do that. And, and so we are working you know, and with some ad tech um, partners on pixel-based surveys where they're able to identify people who've listened to the ads who are tagged and listen to the ads and then follow up with the survey and then have a matching control so you can compare the control to the exposed to see if that you know is showing lift for again awareness favorability consideration whatever else the brand is interested in, in understanding whatever their objectives are it, it is showing some results and there's others who do the same thing we're not the only ones who do that mm -hmm. but i'm not sure we've got it quite figured out yet it's still very early but i think there's that's to me Part of the opportunity, I think, for podcasting is bringing those brand advertisers on board to be able to give them the metrics that direct response advertisers have had since day one, really. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I find all of that super fascinating and I would love to dig into it more because you have worked so heavily on the brand side and, you know, certainly what the industry needs more of is brand advertisers, I believe. Of course, we want to keep our direct response advertisers. We don't want them to go anywhere, but I do believe that more brand advertisers in this space would ultimately result obviously in higher, you know, sales for the whole industry. So I love what you're saying and I love that that the, you know, the goals, the KPIs of a brand campaign are very different than the goals of a direct response campaign. And the in-depth research that you're able to do for a brand to see, you know, like you said, with the brand lift and with consideration and things like that, what the brand can expect or what the brand got from a campaign. One of the questions I have is that, um, I know when I had Glenn Rubenstein from a doctor on, we talked a lot about the different between direct response and brand advertisers. And the point that he made that I thought was really, really great was that direct response advertisers are very consistent, right? So it's like, okay, Athletic Greens is going to advertise this month because they know that they can get a return. They're going to advertise next month because they get a return. They advertise the next month, right? So they, they're going to be constantly advertising because it's it's kind of like, you know, a slot machine in some ways. If I put in this much money, I'm going to get this much money out. They've got that all figured out. Um, with brand advertisers, though, there may not be that same consistency because they aren't necessarily just going to say, I'm going to run on this podcast for the whole year. Maybe they have a particular initiative that they want to push, or maybe there's high season or low season and they want to be out there at certain times. And then the reality is, is I would presume the studies that you're doing, they are not instantaneous, right? Because they're not uh, you know, software base, they're not behind the scenes, you know, big brothering in and looking at what we're doing. It's really, there's some real effort that is being put out. So when we think about brand advertisers in this space, of course we want them, we want them to see the legitimacy of, you know, what it is that we're creating here in the podcast industry. But what about the timeline and how do you see that affecting campaigns? Yeah, this a, it's a great question. We were talking earlier about tangibility, right? Direct response advertisers can get tangible results immediately, right? Whereas the brand advertiser, they aren't even in a sense looking for those same tangible results. Part of it is built on the faith that you build a strong brand and over time that translates into success. You're not necessarily even looking for immediate results. You're looking to build brand equity. And that's something that takes a lot of effort across a lot of media over a lot of time to really build, to have that brand salient so that people say, yes, that's my first. When I go into the liquor store, that Molson Coors brand is the beer I'm going to buy. Uh, and and podcasting, I mean, that's they're, they're one brand advertiser that has used podcasting mm -hmm. and, and obviously has faith in it as well. The only way they can really measure that, they can't measure it from you know, web conversions or sales conversions or website visits. But it is, again, a little more difficult, particularly without those brand lift metrics in place to be able to have them feel like, okay, this is a place where we're actually able to move the needle where we want to move the needle. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you were doing a study for a brand, let's say they ran a three month campaign, are you running the study like while the campaign is running? Do you wait until the campaign gets over? Um, and I know you've done a lot with branded podcasts, so maybe they do a, a 10 episode season. When does your research kind of commence and when does it conclude? I mean, it really does depend on on the nature of the campaign and, and actually the methodology as well. We talked about pixel-based surveys that you want to be measuring that while it's in campaign. You want to be there pretty much from the beginning and right to the end so that you can see how it's built over time, frequency of exposure, what that's done in terms of building some of those key metrics that you're trying to achieve. You can also do pre and post studies as another way to do it as well. Do that will actually a lot for radio because radio doesn't have that digital connection, but you can do pre and post and you connect heavy radio listeners and see if it makes a difference. And for branded podcasts, it's actually the hardest because it's very difficult to sort of get out in the wild with branded podcasts. They generally have relatively small listener Audiences, bases, yeah. but very deeply engaged. So uh, for that work, we're really digging into that engagement as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And we will use listener surveys. We'll also use sort of controlled exposure just to test a, a podcast to see how effective it is in terms of content. We have benchmarks for that. 
and and also what it delivers for the brand as well. But that's like a single exposure before the podcast, usually before the podcast starts, or maybe um, they want to test a different approach to it for a new season or something like that. So that's very much content based more, as much as it is advertising based. I mean, branded podcast, the most important thing is people have to listen and love it, right? The, wherever the brand is able to deliver is, is useless if nobody's going to listen to it. And right. we've seen examples where heavy brand touch can really dampen appeal and stalls it out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think the whole idea of studying branded podcasts in particular is really fascinating because as you mentioned, you kind of need to have an audience size, I would think that was even substantial enough. Have you, I'm, I mean, maybe, maybe this is a question you wouldn't want to answer. Maybe you can't answer, but have you ever come across a branded podcast where you're like, oh my gosh, this audience is so small. Like I can't really create a story around it. Yes. I mean, there are some podcasts that aren't, they're so small. You couldn't even do a listener survey to get enough respondents. But often for those ones, we'll do a study just to get an idea of, of how that get on a single exposure, how is that podcast performing relative to the benchmarks of other more successful podcasts? Is the problem the podcast or the problem their audience development? They just haven't found the, the right audience and how to get to that audience. Right, right. And I think obviously, as we get more and more podcasts, audience building is, you know, increasingly difficult to, mm -hmm. to get a solid listenership. In terms of your work, have you done most of your research on branded podcasts? Or have you and I know, obviously, you've you've mentioned the work you've, you're doing with Triton and audience um, and demographic work. Have you done any um, research around just ads and programmatic mm -hmm. ads or dynamic ads, embedded ads, anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we do a lot of brand list work as well for individual for ad campaigns, and and we've done you know some work with Stitcher, SXM Media on testing ad length using actually controlled exposure approaches to test what's the impact of different ad lengths. We've looked at really established, I think, more than any other study, probably what everybody knew, which is that host red ads are so much more powerful than announcer red or pre-produced ads. So we do some of that. That's really more thought leadership work, but but also do, you know, we are working with uh, doing some pixel-based survey work with um, some of the larger publishers as well mm -hmm. right now. It's definitely part of what we do. And I think an important part, because I think, again, if we're going to get brand advertisers into podcasting, we have to be able to establish that effectively, right? Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure that these companies are hiring you and paying you to do these studies and they don't want the information disseminated out there. But where is that line of where you have done research for a company and you're able to say, okay, across maybe these six projects we've done, you know, I, the pod sites benchmark reports are really interesting to me um, to be able to look at and see like, oh yeah, like we need this kind of a frequency or we need this kind of penetration, you know, in order to come up with a campaign that's going to be successful. Are you ever able to take that research and kind of share it with the industry at large? It's a, it's a good point. I mean, we have done, I mean, you know, sharing some of the things we've learned about what makes a successful branded podcast. In fact, we've you know written a couple of blogs on that. We just did Matt Hurd, who works with us, just put one out about, you know, about a month and a half ago. I, I wish we had the amount of data, the sheer amount of data that a pod site has, you know, because attribution studies are so easy to run and you can run so many of them simultaneously. The sad part about survey research is it still is a manual operation. It's not a turn it on and turn it off. You, you, you still have to, there's still man hours and labor hours and woman hours and everything else involved. And that adds cost to it. So there's only so much budget and there's only so many different studies that we can do. But certainly, you know, we are building enough that we're starting to build some, some really, particularly in the area of branded podcasts, we built some pretty solid benchmarks. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Anytime you could share that, I'm sure we would all just love to, to hear it. And it sounds like you share most of that information in your blog. Yeah. So. I mean, we do try to share what we can without obviously revealing any secrets. Yes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. So one of the things that you said that you saw as being a potential challenge in the industry were programmatic ads. And, you know, as you had mentioned just a, a bit ago, obviously we have seen that host red ads do tend to work better than those uh, announcer red programmatic type ads. And of course it makes total sense, right? If I'm listening to the host, I want to hear the host. And if the host has an ad, I'm much more likely to listen to it than if it feels like, 
you know, feels like an ad, right? And when it feels like, like it's pre-programmed and it's kind of coming at me, I really look at it as being more of that like outbound, like kind of screaming in your face type ads. Whereas when it's a host, you know, you're like, hey, I like the host, I wanna support the host, I'm interested potentially in the products that they're sharing. But I also see that from a scalability factor, if we really as an industry want to hit those big numbers, I think programmatic is inevitable. I go back and forth and you know, certainly have created a lot of content around the pros and cons of both of them. And the way that I see it is I do really believe that at some point programmatic is going to take over, but it, it's, I would say it's growing much slower than I would have anticipated. And I think that that has a lot to do with where technology is at. Mm -hmm. So I think that that could be a piece of it. And I also am curious about the demand side. You know, I, I feel like oftentimes when I, I talk to people in the programmatic space, they're like, oh, the demand is there. We just need more supply. But then you see and hear these podcasts with lack of ads in them. And that makes me think, well, gosh, you know, really, is there, a, is there a, a, that much demand? And is it a supply issue? Because I feel like all of the podcasts would just be, you know, chocked full of ads, if that were the case. And many of them still are pretty light on ads, I think. But I, I guess I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are about programmatic ads and the role that you see it, it uh, playing in the industry in years to come. My analogy I use is that programmatic ads are a bit like self-driving cars. They will definitely be part of the future, but you still have to keep your hands on the wheel because it, it, it and I think it's a scary aspect to be able to sort of turn the switch on programmatic. And then suddenly you have the wrong ads running on the wrong podcasts. And you also, you know, risk killing the golden goose, the, laid the golden egg or the goose that laid the golden egg, which is that amazing relationship between listeners and 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 advertisers that really is unique to podcasting any medium i mean this is the one medium where listeners say that they will support a brand that supports their favorite podcast because of host reds and the kind of authenticity and the connection there as well but i think also there's something about podcasts that is the unique experience and that sense of support for something that you know is to me a lot of the magic for podcasting I back up for a second but to me, a lot of the magic of the podcasting is that there's a podcast for everybody. There's a podcast out there that's exactly right for you. And when you find that podcast, and it may be way out on the long tail, probably is because it's that specific to you. It, it, you know, when you hear that there's a brand or a advertiser who's supporting that podcast, you go, yes, I'm going to look for that brand next time I go. I mean, you don't see that in any other media, except you do see it in ethnic media. You will see it in LGBTQ media. You'll see it in Christian media as well. There's that sense of they're supporting not just this. This isn't just an advertiser. They're right. actually supporting something that matters a lot to me. And I think for a lot of podcasts, particularly out in the long tail, mm -hmm. I think there are those kinds of relationships. And, and I think the real challenge is how do we get to, you know, get the ad dollars moving down that long tail to reach those podcasts where it may not be you know, practical to have host red ads because just too many hosts to deal with. But what kind of ad is there that would still work and still make the message that uh, still communicate that this is a brand that believes in this podcast and we want you to listen to what this brand has to say. Yeah. Um, and I think it isn't a radio ad. It isn't, you know, a Popeye's jingle, um, you know, which you, I have heard on podcasts and sound crazy. Like, I feel like, excuse me, I'm, I, I, my, I'm not listening to the radio right now. I'm right here. You don't have to yell across the room at me. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, to me, and I, it, what succeeds the host red ad that can be scalable could be the silver bullet for podcasting. And it may not be one type of ad. It may be different types of ads that, that do it, but it can't be purely a radio ad. It's a different medium, right? You've sold radio advertising. You know, it's a different medium and the ads are different. So anyhow, that, you know, I, again, my opinion, my theory, you know, we'll see. But I think to my mind, a lot of focus really should be over the next couple of years on how do we get the right kind of ads into podcasting? How do we build smart programmatic Mm -hmm. where we're putting ads into the right place, the right ads in the right place, and, and we can do it to scale. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but that's, you know, again, it's a challenge, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. If folks are interested in learning more about you or maybe the, the services that you offer, where can they find you? Um, they can find me at Jeff at signalhillinsights.com. You should visit our website, signalhillinsights.com and subscribe to our newsletter. We do send out blogs where we do share some of the insights that we get from our research or some of the thoughts that we have with a few hundred people anyhow at this point. So we're building it. So a few hundred more would be great. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Well, and I will say um, that, you know, you and I've been connected on LinkedIn for a little while, but your articles are really great. And I definitely need to put more, more time aside to read them and certainly would encourage um, you listening to check out um, check out the newsletters and blogs because I think that there's a lot of really good insight. So if this industry um, just intrigues you, if metrics intrigue you, uh, make sure that you that you go over and check it out because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, and yeah, just wanted to say thanks for listening today. Oh. Um, and Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Um, I mean, and you're an inspiration too on that on that same front. I mean, I've been watching you on social media for the last couple of years as well. So it's really a treat just to, to have the chance to, to sit and chat for the last 40 minutes or whatever it's been since we started. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Um, and we will hit you next week on the podcast advertising playbook. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Podcast to Advertising Playbook, your source to a better understanding of the podcast to advertising industry.